We made this. Hello, and you're listening to Pick a Disc, the podcast where someone picks a disc for whatever reason they want to, and then we talk about it. I'm your host, Matt Latham, and today I've got comedian slash musician slash label host slash podcast host, just one of these Swiss army humans that seemingly can do everything, and his name is George Chen, and he's going to be talking about Montrona's Hawkeye and Firebird, an album that's very short and very interesting, and I don't really want to spoil anything else about the conversation that we're going to have, because it's, I, I, yeah, the only word I can think of is interesting. Once you've been interested with the conversation and you want to hear more, you can subscribe to all sorts of different uh, podcast apps. You just search for Pick a Disc. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter by searching for Pick a Disc and just writing and subscribing and committing an opinion fraud and saying that we're good, even if you think we're not, uh, on all sorts of apps if they allow you to review. And if you do follow us on Good Pods, uh, please share and like on Good Pods because that's suddenly. Basically, I seem to be climbing up the charts on that, which is remarkable. And, uh, yeah, I'd like to climb further. Um, so, yeah, you can go and do that if you want. That's on Good Pods. Uh, we're not on, not affiliated with them, but I've just started using it, and I find it quite interesting uh, social media social media network for podcast hosts that can share and discover stuff. Uh, so, yeah, have a look at that uh, if you want. That's Good Pods. And also there's the Discord server in the show notes if you want to come in say hello on that way as well and with that i think that's it for me yapping like crazy let's go and talk to george uh just before just before look about an hour before we started recording um doing my due diligence and just and doing research on my guests beforehand just to make sure that you're not actually a serial killer who can somehow <laughs> kill people through the internet um <laughs> i've discovered i've discovered that you're probably Technically, unless I'm unless I'm about to insult one of my previous guests, I think you're my first label runner. Oh, maybe. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. Who Who's the other one? I don't know. I'm gonna. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna. I, I, I'm, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of. Oh no, actually, no, 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 no. You're my second because I just okay. realised. Okay. Yeah, you are my second. That's, no disrespect. Yes. To the other no. Yes. Label. You are my second. Um. Yeah. Because yeah. Simon from doing life uh, records. So you're a okay. second label owner. But I was doing some re- research and. Annoying. Am I the first American label? Yes, yes. Ah, the first American. I'll take the yeah. first American label. Yeah, and That's good the, only, yeah, the only reason I bring that up is because I think, because usually I kind of listen to the, the album with this beforehand, and mm-hmm. annoyingly, I just I discovered Zoom Audio. Was it, no, not Zoom. Oh, Zoom, yeah, yeah. Zoom Audio. Zoom, and then, yeah, yeah. yeah. Zoom audio and then discovered the body double album and just started listening oh. to that. So, well, uh, so I would have pitched that, but I'm like, I'm not going to self promote that much. But yeah, I'm, I'm glad you like the body double album. Did I send it to you or no? No, no. I, just, I mean, I, I just found oh. cause I was, cause I, I just, because I just, because I was just, um, I was just, yeah. yeah, I was just researching yourself just before we started. I just saw the Zoom audio link on your link tree page and then found that album and stuff. And like, yeah, I was kind of listening to that, like about, it's about, quarter past eight in the evening yeah. about 15 minutes before we started so um but yeah i just yeah i just realized that i'm if simon listens to this i'm sorry i completely forgot about you <laughs> but um yeah you're the second kind of label owner that we've had so um and I, I'll, I'll probably have a quick chat with you a bit later that near the end as well so so uh but yeah my um my guest uh george chen from are you from the west coast uh, yeah i've uh, always been west coast pretty much california uh bay area san francisco oakland and now los angeles i've been here about five years yeah ah, okay so yeah so that's um, i've had a couple of LA guests recently so yeah. i think yeah so i've had uh, i think a couple yeah so and i think it, birmingham but, is that right yes in okay. the, yes birmingham so i'm the land of peaky blinders black sabbath uh, I've been there one time, 2007. I don't remember the name of the venue, uh, but it was the height of 2007. It was the height of something called like New Rave. Do you remember New Rave? Oh, um, yeah, but t- basically nearly, yeah. Ah, yeah. so is so, so it a venue in Birmingham then? No. I did a, t- I was in a band and we toured, and like, this was my first tour of the UK in 2007. And uh, yeah, we did a whole up and down run. Uh, we, we did it like, we might have done, I don't think we did Birmingham twice. We did a lot of cities twice because we, we did a week and then a week later 
Deerhoof was in the UK. And then they were just like, do you want to just do these shows again? I'm like, sure. But then it just meant that the shows we had the week before, almost no one went to. It's like we played Liverpool to like eight people because we were <laughs> playing there a week later with Deerhoof. Oh, so it was kind of this funny thing with like, this is great, but we should probably should have just done one of these weeks and not done both. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, wow. So yeah, so um, so I'm glad you made an impression that you forgot on the venue, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, I just remember being outside and having... Some girl will say, you you sound like friends. Like, <laughs> like that was, I was like, okay, I've never gotten that before. But in Birmingham, apparently I sound like friends. Oh, yeah. right. <laughs> okay. That's, that's a new one. That's a new one. That's a, that's a new one. So I apologize on behalf of my nationality <laughs> for, for that. But um, yeah, so George is here to talk about um, an album or more or less an album. It's the shortest album that we probably covered. <laughs> I think the only one that can touch it, I think we did a seven track EP in um in like the sixth other episode that we've done and now we're on episode seventy two and I think this is technically an album, it's only eight tracks, but it's about twenty one minutes long and it's the I'll, I'll, I'm not gonna really ask you to introduce a second and it's this episode's gonna might be slightly different because of the nature of of it um but basically but basically th- th- this is the this is this is the kind of um interesting stuff i was hoping people have been picking for about two and a half years so uh, <laughs> so basically revealing re- revealing the weirdness of people's tastes and i've been yes. so i mean we've we've been talking for months about trying to arrange a recording date and i've been yeah. waiting patiently to talk about this because it's been in, <laughs> it's uh, an interesting one so without without yes. kind of beating around the bush anymore george we need to tell the lovely listeners the disc that you've picked All right. So this is an album. I consider eight songs in 20 minutes to be an, I've done the same thing. I think that I I still count it as an album. Uh, It is by Monotrana and the album is called Hawkeye and Firebird. And it came out on Menlo Park records in 2002. Yeah. And um, why have you picked this quote unquote album? (laughs) So I saw that you were looking for people for your show and then I was looking through like all of my records, uh, like on my own Discogs page of stuff I own. And then I had kind of at the same time been in this hole of thinking about Monotrana and how like there was not a ton of video about it. Apparently it's, you know, it, it's only one album on Spotify. Uh, the There was actually two albums, but the other one's on vinyl only and not on any digital services. And it was just like something that made such a strong impression on me like 20 years ago (laughs) that I'm like still just like, what's up with that? What's up with Monotrana now? And like she is part of a lineage of a whole scene that I really admired and looked up to, which was this mid 90s Chicago. uh, It's for lack of a better term, it's sort of like a neo no wave scene. Mm-hmm. that was centered around like skin graft records and a bunch of bands. And she was an integral part of that scene. And I know a lot of people from that scene. I, I mean, I'm roughly the same generation as those people, but I just was in California and never experienced that stuff live other than by record and just Monotrana. Do you, do you want to know like how I first found out about Monotrana? Um, yes, please. Yeah. Was? Yeah. Yeah. So there was a uh, program on basic cable access in Chicago uh, you know, it's basically like community TV. Like you get access to the studio. There's a show called Chicago Go. And okay. have you heard of Chicago Go? I've not, but yeah. I think, but there is a YouTube video of what I think you're about to. Yeah. Yeah. So there are a lot of bands would go on Chicago Go. Like a lot of touring bands would just go. And it, it, the setup is it's a uh, community studio. And there, this particular show is like a dance party where people are lip syncing to their own material and there's just little kids and like Chicago, like, you know, Mm -hmm. like, you know, urbanites, like weirdos, just all intermixed in this soundstage dancing along into lip sync songs. So uh, people I was in a band with, they were in a band called XBXRX and they were, they had been on the show. They had a whole uh, cassette a VHS tape of like their appearance and like other Chicago appearances. Um, you know, a bunch of people that like Tortoise has been on there. Like a lot of legit people have been on that show. Uh, and then they played this Monotrana video and it is something like it, it's, how can I explain? She's like in a red leotard 
with like this kind of kabuki makeup on and uh, a headset. Like you think it's going to be like this kind of like a Britney Spears ish kind of thing because she's got that headset. And then there's a giant cardboard robot and then it just starts up and it is just like video game music. And she does a dance to it and she sounds like an infant. Um, I, I there's no way to undersell what, what this experience is like. So it just was just like, what what is the deal with this person? And then I learned about uh, that you know, Jody Mechanic or Jody Balthazar is her real name. Uh, but she went by Jody Mechanic in that Chicago scene. And there's a whole in it, there's like so many rabbit holes you can go down with this project. Um, but I knew a little bit about a lot of this Chicago music scene, and then I was just like really obsessed with like what's up with this, and then I I heard the album at some point someone must have had the cd or it was on a mixtape and i was just like this is this is such a weird thing that i'm still thinking about it 20 years later <laughs> it's just like it's one of those things that just hasn't left your head yeah 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 no, it hasn't yeah so i'm assuming was this the first so i'm assuming for, um hawkeye and for, firebird was the first disc of theirs yes of uh I, I and like so the song that's performed on Chicago is Cadillac Fantasy and that's the opening track of Hawkeye and Firebird, and that's the, really the only stuff that's online. Like I said, the other album, the other album sounds totally different. The other album, she's playing drums, which is what she did in her previous band Duotron. Um, there's also this whole lineage about these bands that are called like Tron. So she was in a band called Math with a guy who went by the name Quintron and he still puts out records and performs all the time. Quintron's like huge in the underground in America. Uh, so Quintron and Jody had a band that broke up Then she started another band called Duotron. Uh, and then when Duotron broke up, she became Monotron. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a whole backstory to all these things. It's, Super weird. That makes sense, actually. That's uh... <laughs> now I'm glad I'm able to crack it the case for you a little. Yeah, bit. it's like I was trying to think. Oh, no, where the names from and like I'm gonna try and so the mono is actually because she's now she was actually just part of a duo. <laughs> yeah, okay. Duotron is now Monotron. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. That makes that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> You're like okay. Yeah. Everything everything checks out now. Yeah. Now so... no no more questions. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm saying um, as I, I said alluded to earlier, this is. This is like the um I wanna say weirdest or more obscure uh like album slash like collection of songs that have been picked for the um it's one it's one of those kind of things that I kind of that I've been quite one of when I first started I'm like I wonder if people are gonna kind of go into their deep CD kind of like weird taste Dude. and stuff and like it's only taken about two and a half two two and three quarter years for someone to bring out some weirdness, which is great because um which is great because this is like extremely <laughs> extremely interesting because the well, yeah, I was kind of like, who wants to hear what I think of, like, you know, The Cure or, like, Joy Division or whatever, right? On a British show. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm going to just go, like, what's the weirdest American thing I know about? You know, like, one of the one of the weirder things I know The deep-seated yeah. side of the uh, Chicago scene. Which is also, like, because there's not a ton about it, I'm like, no one's probably talked about this on a podcast ever. And I just even, like, went on Instagram to be like, I, I have like friends that like knew this person in the 90s. I'm like, does anyone have anything to say about Monotron? I like no one responded. But I like I know that it's like every time I bring it up with someone that has seen this act ever or just knows anything barely about it, they're just like, yo, you're going to talk about that. What like what are you going to say about it? And like, I have no idea what that was about. Like, it's just like it's impenetrable to like people that were around it at the time. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, so for for those who don't know, and I'm going to make the assumption that anyone listens to this probably will not know, uh, Monotrona was a one-woman musical performance group active from 1996 to 2003, founded by Joe, Joe D. Balthazar, also known as Joe D. Mechanic. Monotrona performed in costume and in character as one of many self-styled super beings or 14 impersonations of man. These super beings took the form of marginally or partially human figures such as apes, robots, ghosts, madmen or giants with the additional perk that they possessed or thought they possessed superhuman powers. All told, Monotrona evoked eight of these impersonations. Uh, Gorditz from Gorditz, Uka, Jinpao Ki Poo, 
uh, Joey the Mechanical Boy, Hawkeye and Firebird, the Might Moon, Berglamir Frost Giants are the Super Sphere, and Nakadai the Samurai. So, uh, <laughs> and this is like one of those times where I'm like, who edits Wikipedia? Like, yeah. did did she edit her own Wikipedia? Because like, who wouldn't understand the basics of this stuff to the point where? Like, yeah, that is the best. That's the most stuff I could find was anything on Wikipedia about her. Yeah. There's not much about her online in terms of the Montrana. Um, Charlie Balthazar's got a bit more stuff on there. Um, but, I mean, as I tried to research, and I, I told you before I started recording properly, um, I couldn't access her official website because my antivirus was said that, oh, no, you can't go on this website. This website has got a virus on. So I Dude, is, to- that, is that Brexit? Is that why you can't go? What's it's, in it's, a- it's- it's a Sophos. website in Poland. <laughs> Sophos. Yeah. So okay. I think Sophos, Sophos, Sophos was going to say there's some malware on it. So I had uh, to get, I had to get, to try and get a VPN. <laughs> if not a VPN, not, not a VPN, I ended up going onto the internet archive of the Wayback Machine uh, and put a yeah. address. It. So I was mainly, so I was able to go to on a website from like a version of it from 2004 to right. like February of this year. So I was able yeah. to get it. So, um, I think perhaps I'm going to give a bit of background to, or based on what a website is of um, who Jodie Balthazar yeah. is, just to get a better idea of mm-hmm. who the, the woman behind Montrana is. So uh, Jodie Balthazar is a multidisciplinary artist whose works encompass music, performance, film, social practice and sculpture. She's consistently explored ontological themes, specifically the role and status of the human being, human-animal-plant-machine relationships and the consequence of human development, especially in its Western guise on the rest of the world. She's interested in hybrid beings, outliers and outsiders, and what these figures reveal or hide about her perception of natural and social orders. Jodie played in numerous experimental Chicago bands, including Fleshy Hollow, Math, Dot Dot Dot, and Duotron, for the 90s. From 1996 to 2003, she, as a woman performing known as Montrona, she created a one-woman show, and it, 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 I, the, the, you're suggesting that, it might, that she might have had a hand in her own uh, Wikipedia article <laughs> because it kind of is either phrase. So it's either someone who's just kind of done the, the schoolboy error of copying and changing the words mm-hmm. from a textbook. Um, yeah. So, so, But then she's gone, um, she then apparently went to do film production at the uh, University of Southern California in 2008. She's done um, narrative feature films. She's done documentaries. And I think she's now currently in Poland and kind of done more documentaries to do with like mm-hmm. urban uh, it's like um, to do with the wildlife and nature and like mm-hmm. how humans and interact with it. and it's a it's it's it's, 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 it's on this kind of aspect that it starts to kind of goes beyond my understanding of field so i think my understanding is that she's now doing stuff that looks at how humans are impacting on nature and i think as i think I yeah she's got a vimeo i haven't watched all the stuff on the vimeo i was really digging into like she posted archival stuff of these other performances. So, and this was like, I learned this through, you know, doing my reading before we got on here. I didn't realize that Monotrana encompassed these different identities, right? Like these, uh, these eight figures that are super beings. And so she kind of actually documents in, on her website, there's little pop-ups explain like, oh, this was a performance of Uka or this is a performance of Jing Pao Kipu. And it seemed like that was in this period in the late nineties where she lived in Portland. And um, it's, it's like, she was at like all the uh, interesting spots, you know, Chicago in the early nineties, Portland in the late nineties, like LA. And now apparently like in Poland. Um, yeah. Uh, the lyrics are listed on the website, which also I did not understand the lyrics before because it's also like, did you have the experience of like, Wondering whether anything was in English when you were listening yeah, to this. Yeah, because because yeah, one of one of the things I was going to ask is that initially I thought she was singing in Japanese. Mm-hmm. I think that there's a character... Okay, so like on her website, when she did a performance as Nekadai, the samurai, uh, in 2003, she was like seven months pregnant, firstly, and then in a full samurai outfit. And then she credits someone for helping her with the Japanese dialogue. So I think... That's not, but that's not on this record. So I guess what I didn't realize is Hawkeye and Firebird, firstly, are like kind of a pair, as opposed to some of these other things that are just like individuals. And Hawkeye and Firebird, the album is just like one part of a of a eight part series about these characters, and they are, uh, what is the description of Hawkeye and Firebird? They are lovers who are 
a world famous recording TV star uh, who might or may not be Korean. This got a little bit weird for me recently. Like when I was looking through this stuff, I'm like, did I not? Is this kind of like, like yellow face? I don't know. I mean, you could argue that it's just like beyond human or something, but she specifically references Japan and Korea a lot in this stuff. Uh, and then there was like a robot and they fight crimes together and they're in love. So uh, that's the, the, the text of Hawkeye Firebird is that they're like, which you know, I did not know for, uh, for 20 years. I'm like, I, I just thought it was this weird thing. I didn't realize that there was all this backstory to it. Yeah. I mean, um, cause I, I only recently, I found the lyrics, um, cause yeah, fan the lyrics. There's a, uh, I think, flashlyrics.com have all the lyrics from the album on there and stuff. And yeah, I think again, this was like about about an hour, like an hour before recording that I found them. And so I had to manage yeah. to, so I managed to have a listen to it all the way through by following the lyrics and stuff. And uh, without the lyrics, you don't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get, <laughs> you wouldn't, um, you I wouldn't think, get any of this. Yeah, yeah. Um, a couple of da- a couple of days ago before recording, I recorded an episode um, on Radiohead's Kid A, and uh-huh. one of the one of the things that um, Paul, the guest on that one, was saying was that the lyrics to Kid A weren't on the the liner notes, and like because I was looking on um, like Genius at the lyrics mm. and stuff, um, like he said he was confu- he was amazed that um, people are debating about the lyrics on Genius because uh-huh. the way that they performed, d- right, had never matched what they've kind of listened to for uh-huh. year for like twenty years. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm assuming, I'm assuming you had that kind of, that kind of like a same experience when you kind of found the lyrics. Online. Yeah, because like, I like that she, she. I'm assuming this is from her website, so I'm assuming this is what she wrote. And it's just like Aggie, 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 Aggie. I'm like, yeah, that's what I heard was Aggie, 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 Aggie. Uh, but then there's like some clearly English. But it's also because she affects this, um, uh, the the speech impediment, <laughs> which is kind of like. Plain, ewo plain, like like you know a soft R, uh, basically, which is like I yeah she does that sometimes, and then there's also some stuff where it's the robot talking, uh, you, you know it's like there's some tracks where the robot's talking as well. Yes, I think it's the the Firebird. Yeah, Firebird's fi- talking. Yeah, yeah, Firebird, where it's like it where, where she's kind of doing the backing vocals of like an audio automated. It's like Microsoft Sam almost. Um, yeah, 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 kind of like speech. Uh, I can't remember what the thing is like. Yeah, speech well, ties. Yeah, ties yeah, speech thing. Text. Yeah, and 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 then there's this this whole album kind of veers into this other discussion and like another wormhole, which is like chip tune, which I didn't know much about. And do you know much about chip tune? See, um, again, chip tunes. Uh, because I'm not I'm not much of someone who I'm not someone who will listen to, uh, video game soundtracks. Yeah. Um, or, or instrumentals that much, if I'm honest. But mm-hmm. um, I think I found I found a random comment on a YouTube video saying, "Oh, this is um, oh, this just samples Saxian uh, theme tune by Ron Hubbard, and not mm-hmm. not that Ron Hubbard uh, that you immediately think of. It's not L. Ron Hubbard. It's a English right. composer yeah. called Ron Hubbard, um, yeah. who create who uh, did a few who did a few kind of quite a few uh, C64 and Amiga." uh soundtracks and i think there's um there are other tracks which uh, cover i think sample alistair brimble and it's not stuff i listen to but yeah um one i, I listen to a podcast called the retro hour mm-hmm. retro hour and um which is basically it's it's basically people who talk interview people from the either musicians or developers or anything to do with video games and to do with retro gaming um in fact i think it's it's the only podcast that i listen to that is that is still going from when I first started to podcast, listen to podcasts in about 2015. Mm-hmm. Um, it only had about three episodes when it, when I first started listening. It's nearly on, it's coming up to 300. And I think Alistair Brimble was one of the first guests they had. And so, and one, and one of the hosts, one of the three hosts is really into his chip, like kind of demo scene music. So, mm. um, my knowledge of kind of chip tunes and the demo scenes and the, the backing the vocals of this has all come f- a lot second hand from listening to this podcast, um, mm. and I, I and I had n- never expected that one of my favourite podcasts that I listened to would start crossing over onto this one um, <laughs> because the demo scene and chip tune stuff is I've listened listened to like hundreds of episodes where they talk about it but I've never really kind of delved into it so it's kind of interesting to suddenly realise oh okay so I I did listen to quite a few. Um, 
video eight video game soundtracks uh, the last two days. Um, yeah. But the technology behind it, I'm not percent sure of. But um, until I realised there were C sixty four samples again, I thought they were original compositions. Yeah. Knowing they were kind of just like samples from a very short pool of collection suddenly realizes okay it's a deliberate choice and it makes this even more baffling <laughs> it does make it like even more confusing because i'm it's it's it makes me think more about the performance aspect of it and like and and the fact that like in the other renditions like i think in the first monotrona album it's more just all like percussion and noise and like oscillators and things that she's running herself and then so i'm like okay so the C64 aesthetic is specific to Hawkeye and Firebird as characters. I, th- I guess that's the only other thing I can say for sure about it. Um, sh- yeah. And again, I'm, I'm not super familiar with like how chiptune works. I was trying to do a little bit of reading and be like, okay, well, I get that there's like, there was all these hardware limitations to the C64. So you had to like build a way and it's it's pretty fascinating what like rob hubbard did to like build because i just started going down a, a youtube hole about rob hubbard uh like how he like figured out how to use the tones and like make percussions and make make more sounds yeah, out of it I than think, the three chips you know the three notes that were available yeah i think i think it's because i think the c64 and the cc um again the c64 c64 is was like the first kind of home thing computer thing that i owned so i never had mm-hmm. a console until like the playstation so i had a c64 and the Mega. I remember those, yeah. yeah but the c64 i think it had the sid chip and from what i remember because i was trying to del- i was trying to delve back and i was like i don't have time I-, I won't have time to kind of go and try and listen re-listen to some of these old episodes of this podcast and all of this yeah. stuff yeah but my understanding but i do remember people do remember some of the instruments that where they kind of had to kind of trick the sid chip so they had yeah. four tracks. So you had four like MIDI tracks, and they some and like they were somehow managed to do things with it. Overtones, or something. Yeah. yeah, and managed yeah. to get and make it sound like there's more than four tracks going. And you can kind of hear this now. I did. I what I was trying to figure out was and I and I found the original stuff, and it does sound like there's either some remixing or adding of layers of something over mm-hmm. these tracks. Right. I think. I think it's either. 90 seconds wonder i think samples saxon the saxon theme or it's one of the other spring Bush track but there's definitely extra instrumentation applied over that um, yeah that's what i was trying to understand too like and this is like she didn't post anything about this project as much on her own website like whether these were like was she recre i thought maybe she was recreating the synth stuff but it's everyone else said samples and it does sound more like samples to me than like because it's like pretty precise like all the little blippy bloopy bits like seem like really hard to replicate so if it's all sample based she i you know i've other than like that there's a performance of her doing some of these tracks somewhere in Chicago. And, you know, I think it's all on a pre-recorded track, basically. Like the the only other time uh that I've seen her perform, it was all pre-recorded track stuff. So the the video that seems like there's an era of monotrana, which is like percussion and like noise generation and a per, a, a, a a morphing into like it's like performance art. It's like dance. It's more like dance or something than it is, you know, like a band. And the other kind of weird thread to pull on with Monotrana is there's this time when she's in New York in the early 2000s and she's sort of fallen in with this electro clash world. And it's like when you think back to electro clash, this is not what you think of. Right. This is this would not be an obvious. This is like the most obscure part of uh, if you even tangentially want to throw it in with electro clash. But she like even performed with like the guy from Fisher Spooner. Apparently that's in the Wikipedia. Yeah. Too, appa- appa- apparently um, there's a uh, one of the band members. Um, she basically asked her to take I think she was ill for one performance. And so mm-hmm. someone else performed as one of Trona <laughs> for a night because she was ill. So she yeah. let the show go on and stuff. But um, yeah, I think when you mentioned Ele- Electro Clash, the, fir- the band, from my experience anyway, I picture bands like Lady Tron, which mm-hmm. um, again, the, certain, the the Tron suffix kicks in. Um, <laughs> yeah, Lady which Tron. Which is basically, yeah. Just which, <laughs> yeah, Tron, yeah. Which is, um, which for me, and so, and like kind of Electro Clash is kind of like, distorted synths 
distorted mm-hmm. synth uh, or new wave music played as if it's industrial. And um, and my, my my friend Lee who came on for the David Bowie episode always said mm-hmm. that in, he's always thought of industrial music as punk with computers. So like, mm-hmm. uh, so it's kind of electro clash is kind of like punk music, but with heavier clean heavier synth mm-hmm. yeah i don't lump i what well, i think of um like bands from new york maybe more than someone like lady tron but it, it also seemed like it was very tied into fashion and it also seems to be a pre- predecessor in a weird way to something like to like lady i feel like lady gaga sort of has bits of electro clash in her dna as mm-hmm. a performer um someone commented on one of these YouTubes monotrona about, about Lady Gaga as well. I'm like, I, you know, it's, it's, it's so much like its own weird thing, but I could see how it connects to, to like stuff that's still happening. And I'm like, kind of even wondering if the Korean aspect, like the fact that she was so into Korean culture in like the late nineties is almost like before K-pop took over everything. Mm -hmm. Like maybe there's something to that as well. Um, my, so I'm realizing what I realized when I, even after I picked this, I'm like, so maybe what I really like is video game music. And I didn't know that. <laughs> and so maybe I learned that about myself. And that is a whole personality one can have and a whole interest group one can have. And I have a friend who collects stuff like that just on CD from Japan. Like, and it's only on CDs and it's not going to be on streaming services. Like, it's just like a, a whole different genre of thing. Um, but also I think just she fits in, in my mind, to this lineage of like unheralded American weirdos. Like it's, it's like the world building aspect of it. I really uh, latched onto, even though like I only, you know, learned about kind of w- the backstory of it. You could kind of tell the entire time, like she's just thinking on this other level which is like, this is maybe the closest to me talking about like a wrestler or something. If I go into like the, the nineties, Chicago, no wave scene. Yeah. Like to me, those people are like, like, you know, weasel Walter, uh, Zeke Shack who like, if you don't, it's fair. If you don't know any of these people, definitely Google all these people. A lot of them are still doing music and doing really weird stuff. Uh, you know, her bandmate from Duotron, Ricky Sutton, isn't kept playing in bands the whole time afterwards. Um, the friends of they're like friends with these bands, like this other band, Zero Bot, which you know recently had a reissue of like you know music they put out in 1997 or something like that, like a 25 year anniversary reissue. Um, I, I nerd out on like these kind of scenes because I feel like also, and I, that's part of the reason I did pick this is like, I'm like, I want more people to know about this, not just because, not just so I can talk to them about it, but I also think there is something there. I think there's something like artistically valid. And it was like also came out before streaming in this, just this one weird label, Menlo Park, a great label, puts out all sorts of stuff. They put out some early Deerhoof stuff. They put out Japanther uh, to live and shave in LA. So like, there's just a lot of weird American underground stuff that the same people keep popping up over and over again every like seven or eight years. Yeah, I think it's I think particularly as well with this kind of music. I think particularly like um, as I've been doing this podcast, you've got some bands or some genres, and they kind of emphasise certain aspects of the music yeah. or how the music is composed and stuff. And um, I think one of one of the my character arc for this podcast, so mm-hmm. to speak, is like because um, I've always joked that I only listen to about three albums, and my my knowledge of history, my knowledge of music is very limited to my kind of bubble. So like so like as I've been kind of doing this, I've been kind of learning more about music history, and particularly been picking up on the the sound of music stuff. Um, and like you can start to see how some bands kind of like if you've got kind of guitars and synths, you've got some bands that will heavy more onto the synth parts, whereas other bands, same sound of music, same amount of music, same tone, tone will focus on kind of either the guitar parts and use it for that. Um, this this and the scene kind of feels like it's doing it's it's um a band or well a project where the kind of look and the presentation is perhaps the more important aspect mm-hmm. of it and as i think as he was talking my mind was kind of trying to think of can i think of bands that have visual like kind of clear visuals and you mentioned lady gaga and um i wouldn't class this as the same as lady gaga but you can kind of feel the kind of the performative aspect of lady gaga in this and then from lady mm-hmm. gaga you can um you can feel you can probably trace that all the way back to kind of madonna so when madonna was kind of like 
like portraying characters and having kind of like a visual aesthetic to it, but not on the same level as this because I think Madonna was playing pop stars, but making the pop yeah. the songs the live performance feel as essential as that. Mm-hmm. So, and I'm trying to think of a song. There's um, the mentioning Birmingham. There's a band called Misty's Big Adventure, um, mm-hmm. and I've only ever seen them once. And they're just like kind of like an indie pop band, but there is a guy who dresses up in this suit covered in like kind of inflatable blue gloves pinned oh, yeah. across it. And just, and all he does is just jump around the audience. <laughs> so I, I remember, I, I remember take, cause my, my personal Instagram is basically like a log of all the live gigs that I've seen. Um, and I, and I'm, Particularly looking forward to having doing that again at some point. Um, and I remember this is like 2013. I think I took this picture and I took a picture. I'm going. I have no idea what I'm looking at. And someone who someone a friend a friend of mine um, who wasn't there just went up, oh, missed his big adventure, and I went, "Hey, do you know he appeared, he's part of the live act?" Uh, and I was trying to think, and I've I've never seen them, but I, I I'm assuming like bands like the Aquabats have a very oh, yeah. unique visual aesthetic, which, and I think that that should go to their live show as well. Um, Again, and I just again I don't know anything about them apart apart from like one song, but I'm assuming Devo can probably go into that. Devo definitely has like a cosmology around it, like the early Devo stuff is. There's a, like, yeah, a lot of mythology. philosophy behind behind Devo. Um, I was when you were mentioning that band, I was thinking of the film Frank. Have you seen that? Uh, it's no. Hansen. Oh, it's so good. No, I but really is that Frank Frank Frank, Bo- Frank Sidebottom? Yeah, it's about Frank Sidebottom. Yeah, like, I, yes, it's a. Uh, I don't know. Remember who the director is off the top of my head, but it's John Ronson did the script, and Domhnall Gleeson is the lead. Maggie Gyllenhaal's in it. Uh, the drummer is like a real drummer who's in a bunch of bands, actually. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, Michael Fassbender. Fassbender, uh, who's the director? Uh, is it, uh, is it uh, Lenny Abramson? Like okay. Lenny Abraham. Le- it's surprisingly Lenny Abrahamson. pretty deep film. And also like <laughs> I was I watched the beginning of that. I'm just like, this feels like bands I've been in, like so much so. And I'm like, oh, it's Monotrona might have more in common with like the Frank uh film in some ways. Like she's it's a yeah, it's a care it's making me think more of like liking characters, uh like me a lot of people in that I think that time period, I mean, people are still doing it, I'm sure, but like I ended up kind of like switching from doing music to doing comedy. And I always was like fascinated by these characters. I think probably the most successful, not successful is the right word, like someone who's kind of come from the same underground world and became like a fairly legit like comedy persona is Neil Hamburger. Do you know about Neil Hamburger? No, I'm not, not familiar with him. Oh, so, uh, Neil Hamburger is a guy that was in the San Francisco like, 80s weird and like this also overlaps with like like monotron it just definitely fits in with like a lot of costume performance rock stuff that was happening in san francisco also but uh, neil hamburger cannot was a guy who ran a label and then he started doing this character that was a prank phone call character at first and then he started doing like these pre-recorded stand-up comedy albums and then Drag City got a hold of him. And then he started doing those them live. Like he wasn't a live character at first. It like started out of prank calls. So it's like kind of like a failed comedian. And that's the premise of, of Neil Hamburger. He's sort of like, like he tells very raunchy jokes. And he's sort of like hacking and coughing the whole time. And it's like, it's, it, and it's really like, like a very Andy Kaufman thing. Like he's fucking with the audience most of the time. Like, and, and it's like half the audience, it got to the point where half the audience or less of maybe a quarter of the audience to a third of the audience understood that it was this kind of inside joke about, it was a meta joke about com- comedy and about comedians. And then there were people that were just like, what is, what is this? This is awful. Like, and so it was that tension of like the audience of like a minority of the audience knowing what was going on and a majority not knowing, but then that eventually has flipped to the point where like people go specifically to see him now. So like mm. they're that like 80% of the people are just know what they're in for and they're, and they're just kind of eating it up and he has like little catchphrases and stuff. Yeah. So, I th- yeah. Yeah. I think it's kind of like probably sliding away from 
the kind of musical side of it, but that's kind of, kind of performative comedy aspects of it where people kind of yeah. want to get a bit. I mean, we've got a couple of comedians over in the UK. Like Noel Fielding, maybe, is a good example. Um, I don't know if he's character, kind of absurdist. But- yeah. No, he's, he is, but I think he's he's much more. He's gone much more into wholesome um, kind of presenting. So he's 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 because oh, really? like, okay, he, yeah. he's, he's presenting the Great British Bake Off at the moment. Yeah, right, right, so, right, right. Uh, but he, yeah, so like kind of stuff like the Mighty Boosh and stuff. And I think they did they did like live. Can you picture it like Mono trying to on the Mighty Boosh? She totally would fit in, right? Like, yeah, you, definitely. Yeah, like that's kind of like if you like the Mighty Boosh computer game music. And like just weird uh, performance art, you yeah, probably would like there's this. A, there's yeah. A, there's, yeah, there's a there's a very weird and unintentional kind of connected tissue that seems to be forming because I think um, like this. Uh, yeah, a cu- couple of episodes ago, we talked. To, um, I spoke to um, Babs from Over and Underrated on uh, episode seventy. So it was a pick, an episode. So it's a disc that I've picked that she asked me about um, that we haven't actually recorded yet. Recording it Monday, um, mm-hmm. where <laughs> where uh, it talks about robots in disguise, which are a, which were a, a duo and. Uh, I can't remember. I can't remember uh, which of the two, but one of them date, was dating Noel Fielding at the time. So uh, Noel Fielding was in one of the music videos, but they had the kind of like formative aspect of it because they had like pseudonyms. Well, actually, one of the, one of the stage names was Sue Denim, um, <laughs> and the other one was called D Plume, um, oh, as in like non de plume. Um, <laughs> so they kind of had that kind of performative aspect to it, but nothing on the style, kind of like style of like my friend. Monotrona. Um but like yeah, but now the like I was thinking I was thinking more along the lines of um, people like either uh, Jimmy Carr, who I don't know if you're aware of Jimmy Carr. I know I know him as a kind of like a one liner comic. Yeah, he's huge. Yeah. yeah, but like I mean he's he's quite he's not, he's quite well known into being quite cutting and like dealing with hecklers and being quite acidic and mm-hmm. not paying his taxes except <clears throat> cough um <laughs> and to the point where people just mock openly mock him on um, shows about it and he just like shows it off. But like um uh, so yeah, and he'll like be kind of acidic towards people and they're people that it's come to the point now that people will i think there's a part of his show where he actually invites hecklers to heckle him and <laughs> he'll go back and like he will go back it as that's part of his act so mm. like um so but i think that's kind of like almost the mainstream version yeah. of of kind of like of like the the inverse of that concept where people are like this is stupid. What's going on? Where people are going? I want to see the stupid. I want to, I yeah. want to see them kind of deliberately sabotage themselves because that's part of the act. It's like when it's like when you see like the comedy show comedy shows and, um, I mean I'm a, a massive fan of um, Bottom with Rick Marl and Aidan Edmondson mm-hmm. and some of the live shows they do they the recordings on DVD they keep the bits where they fluff up and there's like one section on the first one where it's seven minutes of the audience laughing and they just and there's seven minutes they're just improvising on stage and it's just as funny. Um, yeah. But then, pe- but then, like on the later ones, they kind of embrace that. They mm-hmm. kind of embrace that, and people engage with that kind of weirdness to it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like that's like very like yeah, clownish. I was thinking about it. Like, there's maybe at the stage we're in now, like if you do certain things, it's kind of essentially trolling. <laughs> like yeah. you're like like, and like what I would not like what I would say in the case of Monotrana is like it's the stakes are so low in all these scenarios that she's performing in for the most part that's like it's not really like trolling like like the underground subculture of like Portland in the late 90s is not like it, it's like it, it doesn't mean the same thing I think as we think of as now as trolling because it's like it's it's so much effort to produce this thing that is only going to be seen by like 30 people and like yeah. that's the the energy of a lot of the but I love how she is so committed to it regardless. And I think it's like that's the thing that I maybe latch on to when I think about it. Like whether I mean it sounds like at some point she was doing like these big performances in New York at like pretty big venues, but it's like the same kind of spirit of like you can tell like when she's just doing something at like a, some you know punk warehouse situation the commitment level of the performance is just as high as if she was like you know at a big venue and that's kind of i think one thing i think it's about i don't think it, i don't think it's like a trolling concept uh but i feel like if you were to do something like this now you're kind of doing it for a reaction right like and i think that's maybe what i think is a pre sort of a pre iphone 
world of this stuff, it's like you're sinking a lot of like energy into this thing. I don't know. I mean, I guess I respect what I really respect her as an artist is what I'm kind of like. Yeah. I wanted to like bring this back up after like 20 years. It's like the the commitment level is really admirable, I think. And I think that's kind of what I'm reacting to as much as like the the very strange aesthetic choices that I don't fully understand. It's like I kind of like love how there are all these different characters and there's all this, you know, thought that has gone into it. And like as a as a live performance, like like she has like synchronized dances for all these. She, even if she did not write this core music, like that was all a C64 music. She's created a layer. It's like an operatic layer on top of like the C64 music. OK, so. um so um you've been in you've been in bands and i think you so you've generated and you've and you've said that you do comedy as well um do you feel as if has montrano influenced any part of your creative uh output in the last 20 years or have you thought or has it been a case of i don't want to touch i don't want to tap on that because i don't want to i i yeah well I was doing a lot of like kind of prankish music in the late nineties, early two thousands, kind of before I was really aware of her. Um, And I think the energy that I was kind of referencing more of at that time was not performance art so much. It was maybe like the, the kind of punk scene that I had been sort of steeped in, which was like the, you know, San Francisco Bay area punk scene. There was all different genres of stuff happening. There was like so many weird shows. Like I would go to like 94 Gilman, but it was like, not just like pop punk bands. It was like every kind of performance would happen there. Uh, I guess a good example, this doesn't directly relate to this, but like, you know, I guess Miranda July might be a good example of someone who came up through that 94 Gilman scene and like did this sort of theatrical one woman, like multimedia performance at like punk venues and like clubs and stuff. So when I saw Monotrana finally live, I was like, I think this is kind of akin to that, even though I can't understand. I mean, honestly, with some of the Miranda July stuff, I wasn't, you know, it, it was fully in comprehensible English, but it was like very impenetrable. Like, you know, it was very, it was just so, it's such an out of context experience to have like basically theater in a rock setting. Um, it's sort of, that sort of reminded me of that. And then I, I haven't really, I feel like the entire time I've been doing like stand up comedy, I've never really integrated any of like my music interest with it exactly. Um, I, I will say there's an exception. There is an exception to that I, I do have this character that I do, which is sort of like been, I think, my attempt to kind of bring like this interest I have in like experimental noise music and like stand up comedy together, which is, um, I'll just, exp- I could send you a link of it, but it's a character I called Mike Hans. He's basically Edward Scissorhands, but he has microphones for hands. And the present, the premise is, it's just like, I'm like, oh, I've done it. And people are like, oh, so you finally are doing noise comedy. I'm like, I guess. Yeah, I guess it's noise comedy. I don't know. Like it, but it's sort of like satisfying. It, it fulfills this urge, this satisfaction in me, which neither purely doing noise music or purely doing comedy was able to actually fulfill. But I'm like, I can't do this like all the time. It's like insane. So yeah, um, I guess in a sense, um, I would say like, Definitely like the scene from which Monotrona emerged, like was a scene that I looked to and sort of considered like a guiding, uh, you know, constellation for me in terms of like different scenes. Like I was in this San Francisco Bay Area scene. I was aware of this other Chicago scene. And then like eventually meeting people from that scene was like, oh, I'm putting these the I see all the alignments and affinities of these things put together. Um, So maybe more that like to me, Monotrona was always is like you know how people that are like maybe like three or four years older than you when you're like 18 always seem like they're like you know like uncles or a generation or, away a generation yeah. away yeah yeah i kind i still put monotrona in this level of like what was that and like i i know it was something kind of brilliant and i just i still don't fully understand what it was maybe just the more people talk about it the more we crack the code i mean i was literally thinking of like doing this as like an oral history of people having i just hit up a bunch of friends like what do you remember about this act because it's more about it you're right it is more about the act 
I wanted to highlight the act more than the album specifically, but the album I think is very fun and listenable. And also the only thing that she has on streaming. Um, so I just was kind of like, when I, I was thinking of coming on the show, I'm like, who needs to be kind of get a, a reevaluation in 2021, you know? And I'm like, I think like probably Monotrona should like seem to pave the way for a lot, set up a lot of things, like is sort of like a canary in the coal mine for like things like Electro Clash or maybe I'm going to, I'm just going to argue K-pop out, out of, you know, pull that out of my ass. Um, but definitely like if this act started again, I think people would be super into it. People love video game music now. People love like weirdos and leotards. Like, I feel like if there was like, I, you know, like someone do a TikTok of Cadillac fantasy, you know, like that's what I would say. <laughs> that's like TikTok challenge to you. Please yeah. make a TikTok and bring Monotrona to the, to the, to the, to the Gen Xers, the Gen Zers. Did I say Gen Xers? Sorry, Gen Zers. <laughs> yeah. I forget what generation anything is. Uh, um, I, I, I'd, I'd raise challenge for 90 seconds wonder because um, I don't because I don't think we're going to go into the tracks like we do on usual episodes because yeah. on usual episodes because the songs are like there's a mixture between like one minute ten and like mm-hmm. like three minutes and um, so there's not much deep diving you can probably do with them apart from like the occasional but there's a couple a couple of songs with a couple of lyrics that I wouldn't mind having to going through okay uh, so for example 90 seconds wonder um again i think this was like about 15 minutes before we started recording listening th- through it and then mm-hmm. <laughs> then realizing it is so uh i think there's a song by i think it's missy elliott called one minute man oh yeah yeah which is basically a, about um Oh, not beer in the bush, premature ejaculation. And <laughs> and I'm pretty yeah, and uh nine seconds wonder for a so- for for an actor that has appeared on a kid's show. Mm-hmm. Um <laughs> yeah. Well we would we're not gonna really call Chicago Chicago a kid's yeah. show proper. Yeah. It's definitely always had a little bit of like an adult's like you know, vibe to it, yeah. Yeah. But um yeah, nine seconds wonder lyrics had um there's a, I wonder, he, I, my wonder he got um, P star, 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 as big as King of France. When he moves his P star, 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 it really starts to dance. I like everything he has down there in his pants. He's a 90 seconds wonder with a 90 second chance. And that's the. <laughs> the yeah, I, I did realize, like, I didn't realize how kind of dirty these were <laughs> originally. Yeah. Like Firebird also uh, drops, uh, it's very libidinal. But I guess they're in love, right? Hawkeye and Firebird are in love, but one is a machine. Um, Fire, yeah. So they're they're like it is like a lot racier than I thought it was initially because yeah. it has such a childlike. She's using a child voice that actually makes it a little bit grosser <laughs> overall. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's okay. like the the speech impediment aspect of it. But yeah, there's yeah. I think it kind of has that kind of like weird through line of this kind of like from what you because I never realized it was like a kind of romance thing between like like human and machine. But when you yeah. said, but when you uh, but reading the I think the, the Jody Balthazar stuff from her website. Yeah, I'm going to re- reread this bit. She has consistently explored on ontological themes, specifically the role and status of the human being, human animal plant machine relationships. Mm-hmm. Now. The the SIG chip, the C sixty four chip, um, mm. is from a, an era where like the sound chip wasn't a thing. Um, so this, well, the same the same board that where you can plug in the speakers and to get like proper kind of CD quality music, um, audio stuff. The music at that time, the music was generated by the board. Um, like early PCs, you'd have the same come from the motherboard, so you have like just that beep that are going different pitches. Mm-hmm. Which is probably the rawest amount of sound you can get from an actual machine. Now, I think linking it back to that, you can kind of see her and me sounding like an English teacher trying to trying to justify trying to justify kind of Shakespeare's complex themes when you probably only meant to say what colour a room was. You could argue <laughs> that, um, and again, I, I'm, this is just my opinion there. That saying that if she, if she, but then again, from what we've been talking about, I can probably I wouldn't be surprised if um, Balthazar. Was went down to this level and saying, "Oh, the mach- I use the C sixty four because it's the basis. It's one of the rawest things you can get from a machine because the the sound comes okay. from the actual board itself and mm-hmm. not from 
any external speakers. So the kind, so you got this human having a relationship with the machine. So you got the, the human aspect, which is her performing, dancing, and singing, and the music is done by, and like one of the rawest, one of the like, the most like, the most sound you can get from a machine. So like, she's doing this human machine relationship with herself and the most machine like sound you can get. Right. Well, so this is like in, from a technical question aspect to me, then it does sort of make a difference if like this was samples and it was built in like a software versus like a sampler. Like, I mean, maybe I'm being a little bit particular about thinking about it that way, because it's like it like if it's just referencing computer sounds and not generating computer sounds, does that make a difference? I, it seems like a lot of the earlier stuff is about like, like she's like on the Wikipedia, she's referencing like sine wave generators, baby monitors yeah. and like toy sounds. And like a lot of, you know, people modifying toys is kind of like a long tradition and like noise music as well. Like I've seen people do sets like, you know, t- tinkering with speaking spells and stuff like that. Um, and then like a, like contact mics. I think there was some reference. This was, I thought was interesting. The machine thing that you, you climbed onto. It's like the fact that she was known as Jody mechanic. Um, I read somewhere that she, I don't have this verified that she went to college for like mechanical engineering or something. And there's like a lot of like kind of tinkering in a lot of this stuff. Um, the nature part, I don't really see as much of, at least in this stuff that might be more her now as a filmmaker and the themes that she's exploring now. I don't really see as much nature. I mean, like kind of monsters. It seems more like a, like she loves Japanese culture. She must look you know, like like monster, Japanese monster, kaijus or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, and like there's also this conflation, I think, of like if you were growing up in maybe the 80s, like then you just Japan and Asia just seem like futuristic. You know, if you were just as a Midwestern kid or something. Uh, so I think there is this weird conflation of like like the fact that the character is like Korean and it all takes place in Korea and it's got this video game kind of theme to it. I think that's all maybe connected. Um, but yeah, it definitely is like, a, it does stand a little bit apart from, it seems like she just evolved away from, and I can understand this, like moving away from hardware. At the same time, by the time I actually, can we just jump to where I, that I've actually seen this act yep. one time? Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I think was 2002 or 2003. She, it must've been 2002. She had, she was pregnant in 2003. Um, she, and, and there's videos of this online too. You may have come across these videos where she's like in like black light with this very extreme, like kind of like a, a nun outfit, with like white face makeup. And she's got this little set that goes with it. Like it's a cardboard city. And like, oh, this is like one of the super beings, right? Like they're like monster sized. And she's just dancing around this cardboard city that she like brought with her everywhere. I, so it's like, it, there's more props involved, but they're just props, right? They're not like generating sounds. So it's be- fully become a theater piece, I think, by like 2002. That's what it feels like to me. Um, like a very fun, like memorable theater piece. Like I'm still talking about it. I don't talk about it all the time because like I have to like ask people like, do you know what this thing was? And can I talk to you about it? Um, that's basically. And so I just want to put that in your brain and your listeners' brains. Like, what is this thing? And then people, if I can spike like, like the uh, YouTube searches for monitor. Also, weirdly, she did something with Momus or like, Mo- do you know, do you know who Momus was? Uh, he's sort of like this songwriter performer who kind of like dab delved into the art world a bit in the early 2000s. Pretty popular around like probably around 2000. He was probably at his peak popularity, and he did a compilation where he had her involved in it, and then but he spells it mono space trana like he he treats it as two words mono trana so that if you google mono trana with two words like as two words you'll sometimes find little results tied to that as well um this is truly like what podcasting is about. Like it's like <laughs> the most like it's like people get to nerd out on minutia that like yeah. literally no one else cares about. Yeah, I'm generally... people that edit this Wikipedia page. That's who maybe cares about it. Yeah. yeah. I'm generally surprised that that no one that they never thought of trying to fit the word niche into the word podcast when they first created it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it, to me, it is like very podcasting to me is very much like zine culture was in, you know, 30 years ago, where it's like there were very, you know, 
somewhat mass success zines, but like the as a format, it's really can't it can really be about anything. So like mm. I, I the more the more niche it is, the more purely I think it is like that format. So you know. Yeah. So um so yeah, see so you've answered the have you seen them live into the I've seen them live. Yeah. Um, with the cardboard, the little cardboard city. Which, yeah, I know San Francisco, like at this point, like 18, 19 years ago, I guess. And it was, you know, I just hit up my friend about it. Do you remember the show? He's like, oh yeah, I was there. Like, so it, it's kind of like, it was a cult enough thing like that you probably would have only gone if you had some prior knowledge of like the Chicago scene or Duotron or something. But I feel like maybe in some place like New York, if she was doing stuff on stages with like, you know, Fisher Spooner, it might have like really penetrated this other level of like where people don't have the context even for that stuff. And like, you know, I think now it it seems like it kind of makes sense that she kept going with the sort of like all the technical knowledge she obviously had probably is really helpful in in doing film and like the 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 bootstrappy kind of self-starter nature of a lot of I mean the fact that she like you know just started doing this project and like moved to Portland and started this venue uh which I I talked to a friend who was in Portland at that time he's like oh yeah it was like a it was kind of like a subscription service you would pay a membership to be uh, at her venue and you just get free beers if you showed like your membership card I'm like oh the, so she was like a Costco or like a uh, yeah, like a like a Hulu of of alcohol in, like, <laughs> in your neighborhood back then, yeah. So yeah, um, I, I think like just a fascinating person overall, and I'm just uh, would like to see more than just whatever Wikipedia has to say about it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then it would have been an interesting experience probably to see live at some point. Um, so usually. Um, Probably have like reception of the album and how well it done, how well it did. Um, couldn't really find that much information or anything about the reception of the album, if I was completely honest. But what I did find was people who were who were the reception or crit or reviews on the act of or or the actual performance part of it. Um, so where like, so some. Uh, some people were saying it's like a, a, a per, people were saying the the performances were difficult to categorize and describe as a perfect balance between silliness and creepiness. Not to mention the best <laughs> thing to happen to the sputtering corpse of Electro since asymmetrical haircuts. Um, <laughs> more serious viewpoints. Um, I can't. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure who who wrote this for, but. Um, uh, a critic called Tom Moody described her as a post-feminist, post-human musician, performance artist, and uh, and then pretty much, I won't go and read through, but uh, took a massive breakdown of one of the songs called Joey and the Mechanical Boy and argued about it being a lot more dark than it actually is. Um, Rocktober magazine wrote in its one-man band issue, as long as we can dance to the magical sounds of Monotrona, who really needs the answers? For those who do, there seems to be plenty of them in Monotrona's music and performances. Either way, there is a general consensus that Monotrona was a fearless and enthusiastic performer with the ability to reduce crowds of histers to slack jawed or Nice. <laughs> yeah, was that the Chicago Reader? Is that did you find that one? There is one I found from the Chicago Reader by Liz Armstrong. No, I've not like, seen that one. It's 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 probably the most thorough. And Liz Armstrong was very much involved in all the stuff that happened in Chicago in the nineties. So she, she breaks down like the, the, the history with math and, Oh, I didn't mention dot, 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 which is another band she did with um, Kelly Kuvo of the scissor girls, not to be confused with the scissor sisters who I think are considered part of electric flash. The scissor girls also like a legendary Chicago noisy trio uh, and Zeke Shack, who is actually someone I'm, I, I do know in real life who did all these costume uh costume it's, there's like spoken word elements people you know compare her to like maybe like the residents a little bit um it's 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 of a similar ilk and i believe the show i saw with monotrana was with zeke shack so um like it's this write-up is a pretty good breakdown uh i should send it to you if you want to throw it in the show notes or something like that it's pretty good um it'd be interesting but, yeah, yeah. Really, actually but uh, yeah yeah so, uh, so you've really discussed about seeing her live. Um, 
it's usually part as well where I say if people want to listen to other albums of the artist, <laughs> but unfortunately, this, it's, uh, this is the only one that's on Spotify, at least in the UK yeah. anyway. And you said that if by any nature, anything that was able to see of anything else from, from her, where would you recommend people try to find something? if it's possible or not. I mean, it seems like Vimeo and YouTube has a few things. The pr- the first album is called uh, Uka Meets Jing Pao Ki Pu, and it's on a label called Eerie Materials that was based in San Francisco. Um, I've, I found a copy. I mean, in America, I could, you can probably find a copy of these. Uh, Discogs has a few that are like under, almost all of them are under 10 bucks. But, you know, uh that's that's one thing you could find i would also dig into uh like that entire scene uh which is you know the chicago that chicago scene so duotron flying lutenbachers scissor girls uh probably most famously trench mouth was this band that the drummer is now a comedian fred armison so oh, okay pro- yeah so like there's weird connections that kind of spiral out of all this stuff uh zeke Sheck for sure as well uh, not a lot of Zeke Shack. Well, there is actually a lot of Zeke Shack online, but like my favorite Zeke Shack album, I don't believe is on streaming. Um, and then like dot, dot, dot is going to be very hard to find. Uh, I, I don't even have a copy. I think, I think my friend Paul has a copy that he would, that I, I, I would just have to like, you know, dig around. I, I, these are things like if you went to Chicago, they might be in a dollar bin or like, <laughs> a, probably a dot, dot, dot record might sell for the most in Chicago of any place. But um, yeah, uh, I think that's what I would be curious. I would kind of like want to go backwards and, and maybe like a band like U.S. Maple might be one of the more, <laughs> it's weird to gauge these bands by success. In terms of success, like Flying Blutenbachers has put out our album this year. So from what, since like 1992 or something, they're still going. So by most measures, you could say Flying Blutenbachers is like, the longest running of these of these groups but yeah um uh it's it's a very overall like such a weird fertile scene that i i, I you know was not a participant in so i feel a little bit i feel like a little bit better talking about this scene in a way than like a scene that i was a participant in like i would feel like it's too like self mythologizing to talk about my own stuff um but i feel totally comfortable like highlighting other people's work in this in this regard so yeah um jody mechanic uh hope you're i feel I have a feeling she probably if she has a google alert will find out about this episode <laughs> and you know maybe has more answers and will want to post about it so oh yeah yeah i would be very interested be interesting if 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 she ever, does ever listen to this it'll be very interesting to either filling in the gaps anyway or in the gaps but um yeah as we're gearing up to gearing up to the end of our uh, conversation and it's time for the important bit which is the yeah. the hall of fame playlist so for those who've not listened to this before um this is where i asked the guest to pick a song from the album um to be more slice forever on the hall of fame i can't veto it so if you want to choose one song <laughs> from hawkeye and Fire, firebird to uh, appear on the album and this will be <laughs> This will be on a playlist? This will be on a real playlist? That's this will be on a Spotify playlist, okay. yes. So uh, this will be following the 1975. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is going to be very interesting. You, so whatever song you pick is going to be a very interesting U-turn from... Uh... Yeah, I have had I have had two thoughts about this. I'll tell you my first instinct is Cadillac Fantasy because that is the thing that got me into it. It is the op- is a t- opening track. It's super catchy. Uh, But as I was kind of listening to this on repeat again, I'm like, I think maybe Hawkeye would be the the choice. It's, it's got a, it's a little darker. It kind of lays out the characters a little bit more. And uh, it's, it's also just, yeah, I think, I think that might be the choice. I'm like, if it's, you're going to get like the experience of Monotrona, like a little more uncut i think maybe hawkeye is the way to go okay and hawkeye then becomes the 72nd song to go on <laughs> this to playlist it. i can't wait <laughs> to hear this playlist <laughs> oh yeah it's only following it's following so you've got like the car so you have the cars ride your head robots in disguise in 1975 <laughs> monotrona and um i'm not going to <laughs> yeah <laughs> 
what uh yeah i'm not gonna reveal i'm not gonna reveal it yeah, on no. the uh i'm not gonna reveal Don't what's coming it. next i'm not gonna reveal yeah. what's coming next but on the no spoilers on the thing but i might i might i might tell you afterwards on the when we start recording but uh yeah, yeah that's it's it, that's gonna be an interesting uh phase in the playlist i think considering what's coming next as well um <laughs> and the only yeah. way to find that out is to keep is to subscribe <clears throat> Plug. but um yeah that and with that we've reached the end of our conversation george and um I was going to say, this has been a, uh, like one of the kind of part of the bucket list I have for the podcast and like, um, to get someone's kind of weird, kind of like weird kind of obsession that like yeah. no one else has heard of on there. So this is one of the, so this is kind of like been an exciting episode to kind of delve into. I'm excited. Into. I'm excited yeah. to share this with you and your yeah. listeners. I'm, and like, it's a great concept for a show. It's a real, it's a real fun show. You're very open to whatever weirdness people yeah. bring to you. Yeah. So, yeah, so, thanks, uh, Matt. So, um, so, yeah, if people want to find you and all the things that you do, where can they find you? Yeah, uh, I've got a Twitter account, at George the Chen. That's probably where I would send people mostly. Uh, same on Instagram. I also have a podcast that I run called SupDoc, which is me and my co-host Paco Romain. We talk to different guests about documentaries. Sometimes they're people that just love a documentary. Sometimes they're documentary filmmakers. Uh, we've talked to people like Brett Morgan, who made the Kid Stays in the Picture, and Jane. Uh, we've talked to the comedians and musicians as well. Uh I also have the label, as you mentioned, my label is Zum Audio. You could find that uh, zumaudio.com, zumaudio.bandcamp.com. Um, uh, again, on Instagram, it's the same thing. It's Zum Audio on Instagram. And yeah, I put out the Milk Fed album by Body Double this last year, uh, working on something I can't announce yet. Actually, by the time this airs, I think it'll be announceable. October, uh, I hope to have this done by October. Uh, just a digital compilation, uh, Zum Audio Volume 4, which will have bands from Japan, the United States, Australia, uh, Canada. So just like kind of a mix of music, like electronic music, experimental music, noise rock, kind of like that genre. So, yeah. Okay, I'll keep an eye out for that. And, uh, yeah, that should be on streaming yeah. and on Bandcamp in October, I hope. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll keep an eye out for that and how people find people that look into that so particularly like i said um i'll just i'm probably i'm probably be like dipping into see what other stuff zoom audio has zoom audio yeah oh zoom yeah my audio comedy has. album's on there as well and my comedy album is on uh, all the streaming services as well which is it's george chen word origami so okay yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll have to put that on in the background while I'm editing editing this podcast. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so um, and I think that is it. We've now reached the end of our, our conversation, George. And all I want to say is thank you ever so much for having me, for coming on. Dude, Matt, thank you for having me on. It's great to be on Pick a Disc. You've been listening to Pick a Disc, and I've been your host, Matthew Layden. Our theme music is Pump by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Pick a Disc is hosted by the We Made This Podcast Network and you can find them on www.spreaker.com slash user slash we made this. You can find the Pick a Disc show site on www.spreaker.com slash show slash pick a disc. You can find us on all the usual social media type places like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter under Pick a Disc. You can also email us on pickadisc at gmail.com. Until next time, happy listening to all those discs that you are picking. Goodbye. Hello everyone, this is Tony, Network Chief of We Made This. As you know, our podcast network brings together a brilliant assortment of talent who talk about all kinds of pop culture content, such as the episode you've just listened to, or maybe you're just about to listen to. We're not going anywhere, but we'd love to keep the lights on for even longer if you're able to support our network on Patreon. For just £2 a month, you get your name in lights and the satisfaction of knowing you're helping us produce more great audio. And for £3 a month, you'll get your name in lights, but you'll also get access to an exclusive bi-monthly podcast from the We Made This Talent Pool on podcasting, pop culture, and, well, you tell us. We'll take your suggestions. For less than the price of a coffee per month, you can help keep We Made This going. Just head to patreon.com forward slash we made this, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash we made this and get the ball rolling. Now, back to your scheduled programming. Elsewhere on We Made This. Shut up.
Chucky vision. That's the biggest difference, I think, between all the other franchises, is that they all start, you know, the first Nightmare on Elm Street is Wes Craven's idea. The first Halloween is John Carpenter's vision. Yeah. Whereas Child's Play starts off this studio film, almost. And then as it goes on, they give more and more free reign to the creator, and it becomes its own thing. Yeah, and I think that's more likely what we'll see with the Chucky TV series, which is basically the reason why we started doing this podcast. Observing the Pattern, a fringe podcast. I, th- I think the complete opposite to, to seeing yourself represented would be to see yourself overrepresented and just have it lashed into your face that there's a disabled person on the screen. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, it's, you know, oh, look, this person's gay. We're going to tell you that he's gay every time he's on the screen. You know, that's not okay. Just let them be there, man. That's how it is in real life. They're just there. Yeah. You know, and I, I think she, she plays it very well. Pretty fly. 90s nostalgia podcast. No, but she seemed so lovely about it. It was like, that's my name, don't wear it out. And I'm like, ha ha, funny. That's what mums do. They're lovely even when they cut you down. You know, like even with the, I'm not angry, I'm disappointed type thing, you know? I need to go have a serious talk with mums. I don't know. I, I've never met Mrs. Nicholson, so but it might be worth exploring that. <laughs> hey mum, in the mid 90s, were you sick of my shit? Did you hate me? She told me that she loved me, but. <laughs> Apparently, you can hated me, Mum, because you said, that's my name, don't wear it out. And you said it so nicely that I thought it was fine. But you lied to me. Check out all of these shows and more on the We Made This Podcast Network.